Well, that's a little piece of the um, ballet. I mean, that's part of the hope, the dawn, and to give us all a chance. I think we'll just say the name of the album again, which is uh, the Shankar family and friends. And, friends. and it's on and all those George's pe- new new record label. And all those people who think, "Yeah, and friends," that's old hat. I'll tell you why I wanted that to be that because when it says Delaney and Bonnie and friends and George Harrison and friends and you know, Charlie Chaplin and friends. It's been used to death. And all those people who think that that's old hat, I'll tell you why I did that, is because Ravi Shankar has been well-received by people who like classical Indian music. But he spent 15 years touring the world, doing one-night stands, staying in Howard Johnson's. I mean, the Beatles could... uh, We gave up touring after three years. It was too much. He's been doing it for 15 years and going everywhere. And now he's got an audience for classical music and he's earned it. But then that in itself has pigeonholed him into the hole of being a classical sitar Indian musician. Whereas actually that's only the surface of that man, you know, that he's so fantastic as a composer. And this is just a... A hint. I mean, this album it is so refreshing musically if people can listen to it with an open mind and it's so refreshing. And I tell you, Ravi Shankar will knock spots off Tchaikovsky and a lot of them and all you Tchaikovsky fans and Bach and Beethoven. OK, they were great, but they're all dead. Who is the now? Who's writing anything good now? Who's a good composer now? Stravinsky's probably dead too. And then you've got, you know, all the other guys who's ripping off Stravinsky and all them and all the symphony orchestras who's trying their best to copy the last copy of the copy of the copy of Bach. But who's actually composing really good, fresh music now? You know, well, I don't know, but I know Ravi is. And people need to realise that he's not just in a pigeonhole of being a sitar player, he's a composer. Mm. And, you know, he's something else... God bless him. I'd like to talk, actually, about uh, the Dark Horse label and uh, Splinter and, of course, Ravi Shankar. How did you... Why did you get the label together in the first place? Why didn't you go through Apple? Uh, because Apple seemed to... Um, as Newton said, all apples must fall. I mean, Apple was just going through such chaos from a business point of view anyway, and at that time, John and Paul didn't really want to know about it. You know, they were getting ready to sweep Apple Records underneath the right. carpet. And Ringo and I were planning to try and keep it going. And there was so much problem, you know, just from um, old contracts that it seemed simpler just to start afresh. Mm. You I, came... Yeah, I'd love to get my headphones going because I feel as though I'm not really on, you see. Well, look, I'll tell you what, I'll play a track from Splinter, okay. uh, Splinter's album. This Good is uh, Gravy Train, I believe. Splinter were discovered by uh, the lovable Mal Evans, weren't they? Yeah, well, I suppose if you use the word discovered, you could say that. Um, they were in a band years ago called Half Breed that uh, Mal Evans, who has been with Beatles for years, brought into... He brought a tape and tried to get them on Apple. And he, I remember listening and saying, well, it's not bad, you know, I don't, I don't think it's that good. He said, well, just listen, it's a singer, really, so... We didn't do anything with him, but Mal got... When John made a record, Lennon made a record of uh, Oz to help in Oz's defence, he made a song called God Save Oz, and the Oz people couldn't sing so good, so he got Billy Elliot to sing. Hmm. And uh, they split up from that band, and then a year or so, about a year ago, I was involved making a film called Little Malcolm and His Struggle Against the Eunuchs, and... In this film, there was uh, a part where we needed somebody in a nightclub scene, just in the background, singing a tune. And so Mal Evans brought along those two guys, and they did this song, a song for the film, which really fitted well. Mm. And uh, I thought, because the film is not the sort of film that's easy to sort of sell, you know, so this song was such a hit, I thought, if I could make a hit, then maybe the film people would be more interested in the movie. So I went to do a single with them, but then I heard the rest of the songs, and they were so good, I got involved making the album. Mm. 
And the song from Little Malcolm still isn't out yet because we did too many songs. Actually. Is that is uh, <coughs> the film actually going to be released now? Yeah, the film is just uh, is fantastic. It's really uh, it doesn't have distribution at the moment, but we put it in the Berlin Film Festival and it won the Silver Award. John Hurt, the actor who plays a part of Little Malcolm, won the award. And I just found out yesterday that we won the Gold Award of the Atlanta Film Festival. So, I mean, from that point of view, it's really very good. Mm. You produced the album, and most of it was uh, recorded in your in your home studio, wasn't it? It was recorded, yeah, in David Niven's fridge, actually, <laughs> no, uh, at Henley on Thames. Yeah. Now we uh, built a little studio at home to save the drive up and down the M4, and the studio is really very nice. Little plug for Eddie Veal of Audio Tech, because he did a fantastic job and it sounds really nice, you know, because most home studios have a lot of trouble, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's not really practical in some cases for people to have a home studio, yeah. but in this case it seems to have worked in as much as I learned from John Lennon's studio and he built an 8-track in Ascot, which this guy Eddie had uh, worked on. So after the, the studio got going, John recorded Imagine album there. Mm. And when we, he started recording, he found that there were certain things about it. He started off just wanting a simple little eight-track studio, but actually, when we got down to it, it was with Phil Spector and everything, he wanted tape echo on everything, 49 guitar players, and there just wasn't enough facilities. Yeah. So, I mean, I built the studio basically to have a standard equipment, things which, in normal studios, you know, you ask the engineer, well, I want to do this, and he says, oh, you, well, you can't do that, you'll do that on remix, or... In EMI, they'd phone up some guy and he'd come in a white coat about eight hours later pushing a trolley, and it's all a big deal to get something which you've done, you know, on every record. So I yeah. wanted that built in as standard equipment. So consequently, the studio at Henley is um, five years ahead of all the studios in London. And that's actually not my opinion, that's the opinion of the guy who builds record plants and places in. Mm. No, and, but that is a uh, thing, because it's not a commercial studio, I spent my own money to do you know, what I wanted, whereas a commercial studio is catering to the masses and they're going to have lots of people in there stomping all over the place, putting their mm. feet and knocking the drinks down the mixer. And so it's not really practical to put out such a big outlay, mm. particularly if you have five studios. Going, going back to Splinter, uh, lots of uh, famous musos played on it. I mean, they had a lot of help. Not really. I mean... Class form um, uh, well, yeah, but I mean, everybody I know is famous. I don't know anybody who isn't famous. So it's not really that we're putting famous people on. It's just that my friends, the best. in some yeah. way, and even if they were unfamous when I first met, like Klaus Vormann, yeah, nobody ever had... heard of him, but now he's famous. George, I'd like to sort of bring in one point that obviously I've never met you before, and the the image that I had of you uh, by reading all the the pop papers and all the things about you was that uh, you were terribly sort of into mysticism and pretty far out and, you and all that. And you're very down-to-earth now that we actually I'm very meet. practical. But the I'm press paints a simple. totally different picture of you. Yeah, because the press are such dummies, generally speaking. I mean, there are some great writers and in some ways do a useful job, but generally speaking, they're such a bunch of dummies that the whole thing is just a seller paper with some stupid sort of headline or some type of thing. So they do tend to misrepresent to the masses what's happening. My image has come across like I'm some weird old mystical uh, ex-Beatle, the gentle giant of pop, you know, what's all that? Like but, uh, but I think you know, that people, stupid. people obviously think that because uh, the four of you went to India and then you came back from India and you're the only one that sort of got anything concrete out of it, that you're, you know, really into this sort of well, I think, mysticism um, thing. You know, I think the others did uh, get a little. I mean, I would really be very disappointed to think that Ringo, Paul and John didn't get anything out of it. But it's the way we sort of viewed it. You see, because first of all, I mean, I got into India uh, through Indian music and through Ravi Shankar, and I had my association with Ravi, who in my life has been one of the greatest blessings in as much as he's helped me have an alternative point of view on music and on life and on cultures and on um, the whole, you know, origin of where we're all coming from. Mm. 
And through his discretion, then I had a feel for India before I went there with the rest of John Paul and Ringo. Now, John is uh, Lennon. He's fantastic. He's no dummy. And he knew there's something in that thing, the meditation. Mm. I mean, if I could start getting into that dialogue by saying the first thing that I read that really impressed me, because I was almost a Catholic, I was almost brought up as a Catholic, but when I was about 11 and I was sitting in this church with all these people who could well have been in the red line or the angel on the bridge, uh, the only thing that came across to me in the church at all was these oil paintings of Christ struggling up the hill with the cross on his back. And I thought, well, you know, that looks heavy. There's something going on there. Mm. But as to the rest of the building and the priest and the people, you know, I just thought, it's stupid, you know, I can't get anything out of this. Can I actually quickly continue that? that discussion that we were having before? Because it, it About brings the bombs it, and all that. brings us on to the Material World Foundation, um, which, I mean, could you explain that? Because a lot of what you do is for the Material World Foundation, isn't it? Uh, yeah, OK, I mean... There's so, it, there's so many things, you know, it's hard just to praise everything into mm. a few minutes, but in the time when we were in India and John and Paul came back to England and started Apple, I mean, it was an idea, we'd start our own company because Brian Epstein had died and there was no future with, you know, the furniture business, so we decided we'd go on our own. And uh, at that point, Apple, because we were basically nice people... Uh, wanted to, um, because we had to, in a way, fight our way up. And, you know, we were turned down by everybody, like everybody who's trying to make something, you know, goes through that one. We were turned down by everybody too, and we wanted to try and be nice, except it backfired because of our um, lack of uh, of experience. So Apple turned into a seething pit of people, freeloaders and people wanting everything. But part mm. of the original idea was to have a foundation in which we could help, you know, something. Because people always think or thought that the Beatles, you know, well, their money is just pouring out of their ears. So it's nothing just to give a five or a ten or a twenty quid or a thousand pounds or even a hundred thousand pounds. But Knowing what it's like with the British government, you know, I mean, it's something like if I spend £10, I have to earn 100 or 150 quid to spend £10. So if I go around giving people tenors out my pocket all the time, it's really I'm giving them 100 quid. So Apple, we thought, the idea of the foundation, but like so many other good ideas, they got lost in the chaos. Um, <clears throat> and then coming further up into, like, 1970 or 71, I forget, when the Bangladesh situation occurred. Now, if I'd have had a foundation then, we could have sponsored the concert and the money could have gone there as quick as possible without any problems, but Bangladesh was such a quick thing and it was so important that it should happen as soon as possible, so there was no real planning for that. Also, the manager we had at the time was on his holidays and not all that keen to do it on that date. He wanted to postpone it, but you can't postpone things when people are getting, you know, dying and doing that. I mean, it was an emergency. So we set up the foundation. It took three years, and then you need money to give away, right? So I thought the easiest way to do it is to just give the copyrights of my songs. So I donate the copyrights of my songs, and when I make a record, if it sells then the money goes to the receiver for um, the performance and the money that the publisher or songwriter or publisher and songwriter would normally get goes to the foundation so I can mm. fund it. And so then with that money, I can then give, if the you know, Red Cross says, give us a pound, I can give them a pound and it's a pound. I don't have to earn ten to give, mm. you know. Is it the same sort of thing with, with Dark Horse, your new record label? Uh, no, Dark Horse is just a sort of label. It's really, um, you know, my involvement with that is purely just like an outlet. Hmm. You know, I just do whatever I produce now, I'm, I'll produce, uh, which goes to Dark Horse, and they in turn have a deal with A&M, and it's distributed by them. I mean, things about it, you know, is obviously my influence, like the logos and things like that, because hmm. most of the stuff will be 
what I produce, although Dark Horse, there's a, you know, it will still, if we have other artists, or if they have other artists, I mean, there's no, I can still rent other producers, say, for mm. example, Splinter's record I produce, but I don't necessarily have to produce all of Splinter's. I mean, I can hire independent producers, so it's just like anything else. Because the second But the album... foundation and Dark Horse is nothing to do with each other, really. Yeah. The foundation is um, mainly to try and do things, you know, some things connected with the arts, because I'm very conscious through my relationship with Ravi and India and Indian music of the West, because but basically I'm just a Liverpudlian rock and roller. So from that point of view, I can understand why people in the West don't particularly understand, I mean, those that don't understand Indian music or who don't want to. So when I first heard this music in 66, which was not just Ravi and sitar, but involved lots of different instruments just put together like an orchestra, mm. then it was so fantastic. I knew that that's the way that people in the West will suddenly realize that there's more to it than what they think, because there is a tendency for them to think, Oh, yeah, Indians, they lie on nails and uh, they don't eat cows and they're all starving and they can play any notes they like in their music. You know, that's the impression the West has been given. So, But it's actually very... Uh, you can write down every piece of music can be written, uh, sung, even down to the drums. They can play the drum rhythms, they can write them down, and they can say them. They have a language. I mean, it's, it's so complex that Indian classical music is it's like light years ahead of anything in the West. Mm. And the nearest anything anybody's come to it, I suppose, is, uh, you know, certain jazz musicians. And they're usually the ones who acknowledge that Indian music is far out. It's like, I mean, even... Uh, John Coltrane, I mean, he studied with Ravi. Ravi spent time with lots of musicians like that, just giving them ideas on various rhythm cycles. In mm. Western music, we've got two basic scales, major and minor. In Indian music, there's 72 scales. There's 108 variations of rhythm cycles. And it gets so deep that, you know, really, I'm, I just scratch the surface of it, but mm. it's so complicated and it's so far out that... The West don't know what's going on when it comes to music, really. When you, But it takes a certain... You know, it's like if you walk in a room full of people speaking Chinese, mm. you're not going to know what they're saying straight away. But if you familiarise yourself with it, slowly it, you'll get your ear tuned to it. And uh, I and think the next record you're yeah. looking like going to play <laughs> is not the one to follow this bit of dialogue. It is. Actually. It's not... Oh. Well, because this one is not strict classical. And I want to explain this later. You're going to play Krishna, Where Are You? Uh, okay, I'm so missing you. I'm missing you. This is a composition by Ravi Shankar, which is the first song he wrote in English. And when he first sang this to me, and played it to me, it just blew my mind because I heard it from my pop background. I said, it's, I'm just, that's a hit. It's so lovely. It's a lovely song. You should write more of these, Ravi. And he said... Oh, I've, you know, I've been trying not to write these for years because he's, you know, people always put each other into pigeonholes and he's one of the greatest classical musicians. But if he wants to write a song in English, it doesn't take or distract from his talent as a classical musician. Mm. But people want to lock everything up, like Melody Maker this week. Some guy did an interview on Ravi, and whoever you are, Mr Spencer or somebody... You're, you know, he's really just a bitchy article, just saying, is he going heavy, you know? He's going light. This is what Melody Maker thinks is heavy. I and in actual fact, it's light compared to Ravi just playing on his sitar. It's very, very light. Are you uh, as heavily interested in sort of what goes on in the world as... <clears throat> yeah. Well, I didn't really want to do this for a living, I tell you. I really <laughs> wanted to be a lumberjack. <laughs> Tell me, how did you start in this business? Uh. No, I'm... You know, I mean, I'm a part of creation just like the rest of you all. And uh, I get pushed and shoved around and tossed around like the rest of you all. And if you ever give a thought to why you're getting bashed about, it's usually because it's people like the presidents of the United States and our beloved Harold Wilson from Snotty Ash... And all the people who control our lives to a certain degree, I mean, that's why we're fortunate 
that they can't get you after you're dead. At least it, the way out is they can get you all your life and they can impose the naive or ignorance upon you and they can make you pay, which is really what your life is about. It's like school, you know. I'm interested in wars and deaths and killings and murders to the degree that I would like to see it not there, you know. Mm. I try not to think too much about it because if I did, I'd be so depressed I wouldn't be able to sing some tunes. Yeah. But in your life, um, obviously with uh, the amount of things that you can do because you're in a position... I got the breaks. Yeah, yeah but you're... I mean, that's another one I'd just like to clear up. In life, Jesus, you know, taught the law of karma, which means action-reaction. Now, if somebody's walking down the street with a hunch on their back, then it's probably because of some actions they themselves have done in the past. Action, reaction. I mean, you know, karma, that's what that is. It means that we have... Whatever we are now, we ourselves have caused. And whatever we're going to be in the future, we it's up to us. It's up to our actions. Every action is equal and opposite. That's a law of nature. If that's the only thing you ever learn in your life, then God is fur. He's not watching over everybody saying, you did that, so give him a kick in the behind. You know, there's just a law of nature, which is action, reaction. And so it's ourselves who get ourselves in a mess or get ourselves out of it. But we seem, in the world as a whole, to be more in a mess than not in a mess, although there's a lot of great souls in the world. But you achieved... Uh, <coughs> Great notoriety so and, that's great, the bit, the and great success at a, at a very early age. I mean, at a relative early age, you had everything thrown at you so quickly um, that, you know, I think you... But it wasn't thrown at us. We had to get out there and try and find it. It was only when we got ourselves to a position then they start throwing it at us. Yeah, but the snowball. Once they realised there was money in us, then it was all thrown at us. But nobody would throw a thing at us in the beginning. I mean, a simple example is... I saved up for years and years to get a guitar ages ago and I got 70 quid and I had it in my pocket and I felt as though I was going to get murdered if anybody knew I had it in my pocket and I got down there and I bought this second-hand guitar which was a really nice. When we became famous, people are giving me guitars left, right and centre. You know, when you've, you know, when you don't need something, people give it to you. It's when you need something that nobody gives you a thing. And again, <coughs> you know, that's... Uh, a pity that you know people won't give you know really i i feel now that whatever i give uh i get it back you know it's like there's an old proverb that says the smile you give out comes back threefold and it's true you know if you can raise a smile you do tend to get two or three back mm. which enables you to give six or seven back and you get 15 back mm. but if you kick somebody in the behind there's a good chance somebody going to hit you on the head with his gun that's karma. Let's let's play something from. Let's uh, get a bit lighter. <laughs> Ravi Shankar's album. I'm, I know I pronounced that wrong. Ravi uh, Shankar. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what's, this is called the dawn. <coughs> isn't yeah. It? yeah. Now, th th I mean, this is an example. Can I just say yeah, a few words before you say this? This is on the other side of. They heard the song "I'm Missing You," which is really like, you know, top of the pops. It should be top of the pops because it's lovely. This other side is a ballet which Ravi composed and which eventually is going to be you know, put on stage as a ballet. But this piece represents, after the dream, I mean, a dream, a nightmare, and then the dawn. The dream is really like thinking of all the nice things when we were kids and all the good things, and the nightmare, which is like now, the 10 o'clock news or the 7 o'clock news or Harold Wilson or President Nixon. The nightmare is our life this moment and then this piece we're going to listen to is the dawn which represents our hope for the future and it also is spot the religion in as much as God or the truth underlies all religions and that's one thing I couldn't get behind with the Christians that I was exposed to was that they have a tendency to think that all the others like Buddha or um, Krishna, they just think they're all a bunch of pagans and that the only one is Jesus and he's the only son of God. Like, for a kick-off, everybody is potentially divine. Everybody's a potential Christ. And the truth underlies all the religions and what, in this part, the hope that Ravi is trying to get across. 
at least my understanding of what he's trying to get across, is that, you know, it should all be seen as one, you know? And so I hope there's no other religion who's going to get uptight at us because we didn't put him on there. Take it away. <laughs>